Hello, thank you all for joining me today uh, for another London Fenry Specialist CPD webinar. And today we're going to be talking about urogenital ultrasound and more specifically the ultrasonographic technique that you guys can use to try and optimize your ultrasonographic investigation of all of the urogenital organs. Uh, before we get into it, uh, a very brief introduction. Uh, my name is Ian Jones and I'm a radiologist. I graduated from the Royal Veterinary College in 2004 and I got my uh, RCVS imaging certificate in 2009. I returned to the Royal Veterinary College in 2013 um, to start my imaging residency and I got my European Diploma in Veterinary Di Diagnostic Imaging uh, in 2018. These days you can find me at London Veterinary Specialists, um, the only multidisciplinary referral veterinary hospital in central London. And if I can be of any assistance to you, whether it be providing um, some advice on some interesting radiographs that you might have, or having a chat about which imaging modality might be most useful and when working up um, a particularly challenging case, then you can give me a call at this number um, or drop me a line via email at this email address. This presentation um, very much based on the techniques that are laid out in um, Practical Small Animal Ultrasonography um, by Pete Mantis, who is my supervisor at the Royal Veterinary College. And this book is exceptionally good at uh, laying the foundations for a good comprehensive abdominal ultrasound examination. So if you were just starting out and um, you uh, have only just picked up the ultrasound probe and you're looking to improve your technique um, to find all of the abdominal organs and be confident about which organ is which, then I'd certainly recommend this book, Practical Small Animal Ultrasonography. Um, the Atlas of Small Animal Ultrasound by Henick, um, that's very, very good. Um, for getting into um, all the different sorts of pathologies that you can diagnose with ultrasound. So once you get a little bit more confident about your technique and you can do a complete abdominal ultrasonographic evaluation, then you need to try and work out what it is that you're seeing. And um, Penic um, is uh, especially good for that. Um, so uh, if you're interested in small animal ultrasound and you're looking to get some textbooks, then these are the two that I would recommend. Um, I think uh, we're probably on to uh, the next edition of Penic at this stage, um, but this is the one that I'm most familiar with because this is the one that I used during my residency. So um, during today's presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about all the different problems that you might encounter uh, when you're in practice and um, what the uh, differences are between the probes and um, when you should use each of the probes. Um, we'll very briefly talk about um, how to set up your ultrasound machine. Um, we're not going to get into the rough of talking about how to program presets, um, but we'll talk about the um, knobs that um, you're going to end up twiddling most frequently in order to optimize your images. Um, after that, we'll talk about um, how you move the probe. So teaching ultrasound, which is a very practical skill, um, is very challenging and um, it's often very difficult to translate uh, what you're doing with the probe to uh, your audience um, or the students. And there are a couple of probe movements um, that we use uh, very frequently and those probe movements are the best way to describe how, for example, to get from the left kidney um, to the aorta, to the wind artery, to the left adrenal. Um, so um, we'll talk um, about some of the different movements um, that we're going to need um, once we uh, start getting a bit more confident about um, identifying all of those abdominal organs and finding more challenging structures like adrenals and pancreas. And um, using those movements, um, we'll talk very briefly um, about uh, how you can get nice images of the kidneys, um, the urinary bladder, 
uh, the prostate, the testicles, the uterus, and the ovaries. So all of those urogenital organs. So if you wander into any uh, referral veterinary hospital and uh, most big first opinion practices, you almost invariably find an ultrasound machine. And uh, all of these machines will have at least one probe and um, some of them will have multiple probes. And um, the probes usually consist of um, either um, a curvilinear probe, a microconvex probe, a uh, high frequency linear probe or an ult ultra high frequency linear probe. And, and the difference essentially comes down to the frequency. So the larger curvilinear probes tend to have the lowest frequency going all the way up to the hockey stick probes, um, which have an extremely high frequency. So the curvilinears um, around five megahertz and the uh, ultra high frequency hockey stick probes around 18 megahertz. And this is what they look like. So uh, here we're going from um, the lowest frequency to the highest frequency. So um, on the far left, um, we've got the big old curvilinear probe, um, which sits at around five megahertz. Um, we've then got the uh, micro convex probe, which sits at around seven megahertz, um, the linear probe um, around 12 megahertz, and then the uh, ultra high frequency hockey stick probe which is around 18 megahertz. And um, the main reason for choosing one probe over the other is essentially down to the frequency. Um, so uh, the lower frequency the probe, the more penetration you'll get with your incident ultrasound and the better the image quality for deeper structures. So. Um, if we look at the curvy linear probe, um, this probe has a really big curved footprint. Um, it's uh, low frequency, so it's around five megahertz. That means we're going to get pretty good penetration with our incident ultrasound waves. And this is the probe that you'd use for examining um, very deep structures. So uh, for me, if I've got a very large dog and for doing abdominal ultrasounds, I'd consider any dog much bigger than about 25 kilograms as um, a large dog. Um, anything uh, beyond 25 um, can be more challenging to image. And certainly patients that are very deep chested um, can be very challenging to image because a lot of their cranial abdominal organs um, are intercostal. So you'll find that you have to place the probe in between the ribs and will really have to lean on the probe um, up under the ribs in order to get uh, decent images mm -hmm. of uh, the liver, the gallbladder, and all of those structures around the hilus, um, so portal vein, um, the hepatic lymph nodes, the common bile duct, um, and the pylorus. So this probe um, tends to come out when I have a bigger dog and I'm really struggling to get decent images of the liver. So big probe, curvilinear, low frequency, and this is used for bigger patients and deep structures. And like I say, I tend to find that I use this probe most often for uh, big dogs and more specifically uh, imaging the liver and the structures around the hilus. So uh, gallbladder, portal vein, uh, and hepatic lymph nodes and common bile duct. So low frequency means lots of penetration means deep structures, means you tend to use it um, in bigger patients. So this is our microconvex probe. Um, you can see that this probe um, has been in the wars somewhat. Um, it's certainly not as handsome as it used to be. A lot of the uh, rubber on the footprint has fallen away. Um, and that's really a testament to just how often this probe gets used. So the microconvex probe is going to be your workhorse. It's, it's going to be the probe that you're going to use most often and um, you're most likely to find a mid-frequency microconvex probe um, as the probe that's attached to an ultrasound machine in any practice, particularly if there's only one probe. So if you don't have a choice, this is most likely to be the one that there's going to be. Um, now the microconvex probe gets used for um, everything really. It's It's got a nice small footprint, so it means um, you can get in between the ribs, um, even on small patients, 
and you can get up underneath the ribs, um, even in big patients um, and very deep chested dogs. Um, the frequency is usually around seven, so it's kind of mid range. So you get good resolution and um, decent enough penetration. And this is the product that uh, I tend to use most for um, sampling. Um, so uh, pretty much all of uh, my FNAs, apart from either very, very deep structures or very, very superficial structures, will get done using this microconvex probe. Um, so this is your go-to probe. This is your workhorse. This is the one that you are going to rely upon most often. It's suitable for small dogs, medium-sized dogs, for most of the organs in big dogs. Um, you can use it for um, cats as well, um, although um, I will tend to use the Limia Pro uh, more often for cats, but a microconvex probe for cats is so absolutely fine. And it's the probe that you're going to use for sampling. Um, so this is your workhorse, this is your soldier, this is the probe that you're going to reach for most often. And um, as a result, um, they tend to get pretty beat up, um, like uh, ours, um, which has seen slightly better days, um, but still works absolutely fine. Um, so this is your kind of mid-range, microconvex, medium frequency probe. Um, so this is the one you're going to reach for most often. So this is now moving into the higher frequency range. So uh, higher frequency probes um, give you uh, much better resolution because they are a higher frequency, um, but um, you get poorer penetration. So your incident ultrasound um, is going to be attenuated um, very quickly um, by the first uh, five centimeters of soft tissues that it encounters. So. Um, you're not going to be using a linear probe like this for um, a deep structure. Um, so this is a probe that you're going to use um, if you're going to say to grab double and ultrasound in a cat, for example. Um, so uh, most cats um, are going to be around five kilos. So you're not going to have to get through many centimeters of tissue um, in order to examine all of their abdominals. And the uh, 12 megahertz that you get with this linear probe is going to be sufficient to uh, really uh, examine everything, um, even the um, liver um, in most cats. Sometimes if you get a really big cat, so if you get a cat that's closer to 10 kilos uh, rather than to 5 kilos, the linear probe is going to struggle a little bit. And in those instances, uh, you can put it away and get the microconvex probe out again. But um, it's, it's absolutely possible, and I would recommend uh, doing abdominal ultrasounds in cats with um, the higher frequency linear probe. It, it can be tricky from a technical standpoint initially because the footprint uh, for this probe is quite big. Um, so you've got this big rectangular footprint, and you're trying to drive it around an abdomen that is reasonably small, and, and that can be pretty challenging when you first start using it, and particularly if you're used to the small footprint with the microconvex probe. But the resolution is so much better, you get a much, much better image quality. And in cats, when you're looking at tiny little structures like the common bile duct and like the duodenal papilla, um, you want to be able to achieve the best resolution possible because those are tiny structures you know, they're only a couple of millimeters thick um, so you really do need to get used to using um, the linear probe um, even though the, the footprint can feel kind of big and kind of clunky when you first start to use it so this linear probe um, yeah gets used for all cat abdominal ultrasounds um, it's it's rare that i have to resort to the microconvex and a slightly lower frequency to look at the cranial abdominal organs like the liver, um, but in some really big cats, particularly big fat cats, um, I will have to resort to the microconvex. But um, as a rule, if you've got one of these probes available, um, I would get used to using this probe for um, completing cat's abdominal ultrasound studies because you're going to get the best possible resolution. So the last probe is this ultra high frequency um, hockey stick. Um, now, this acoustic probe goes up to about 18 megahertz, so super high frequency, which means you can get beautiful, beautiful images of really superficial structures. Um, you're not really going to be, you're not going to be able to see very far into the patient. Um, so after a couple of centimeters, um, you're going to lose all of your incident ultrasound. Um, it's going to be attenuated away, and um, 
you're going to get nothing. Um, but if you're looking at a very superficial structure, um, like a lymph node, for example, um, then it's super useful. Um, very good for ocular ultrasound as well. So um, when you're doing oc ocular ultrasound, you, you're basically placing the probe onto the globe. Um, so there really isn't any um, tissue to get through before you uh, start to uh, examine structure you're interested in. Um, so ocular ultrasound, this is really good for um, yeah, lymph nodes, um, anything really superficial. So occasionally people will ask me to examine sort of skin lumps um, or FNA skin lumps. Um, this probe is super useful, but it, it doesn't come out that often. So ultimately, um, the two more mid-range probes, so the linear and the microconvex, are the probes that get used most often, um, and then um, the ultra high frequency and the low frequency, so the hockey stick and the curvilinear probe, they only come out um, when uh, I'm either looking at very deep structures and very big patients, um, and that would be the low frequency curvilinear, um, or um, very small, very superficial structures, and that would be the ultra high frequency hockey stick probe. So yeah, those are our weapons, and we should choose them carefully, um, because if we choose wrongly, um, that's really going to affect um, the quality of the abdominal ultrasound scan that we're able to offer. So now that we have selected our probe, um, and uh, more often than not, it's going to be the microconvex probe um, that we're going to, to select, um, we need to know what to do with it. And um, we need to know more specifically how to hold it and how to move it. Um, and uh, there are different ways um, you can um, hold the probe. Um, so we'll just touch, touch briefly on that. And then we'll talk about the different sorts of probe movements. And it is possible to break it down into um, sort of five movements. So a slide, a rotate, uh, a fan, um, a push on, a pull back, and then a follow. Um, so uh, we'll take a little look initially at how to hold the probe. And um, there, are, there are two ways that I find that I tend to hold the probe. Either um, I'm holding it like um, a pen, um, and that's the image on the left here. Um, so um, if you're holding it like uh, like a pen, then most of the time you're examining a more superficial structure. Because if you're holding it like a pen, then um, it, it's possible to execute really fine, subtle movements, but it's very hard to really apply too much pressure onto the probe. So if you're really trying to tease out a structure that's very deep, um, or if um, you're looking at a structure where you have to come up underneath the patient, um, if you're holding the probe like a pen, um, that can be pretty tricky. And in those instances, I tend to hold the probe a little bit more um, like, like a torch. Um, so um, if, for example, I'm looking for the pylorus in um, a bigger patient, then I'm going to have to come up underneath the patient um, while the patient's in right lateral recumbency um, to try and follow the duodenum and um, find the point at which the duodenum joins the stomach so to confidently identify the pylorus. And um, often, particularly, again, in very deep chested patients, um, you really do need to, to lean on the probe and, and push on quite a lot um, in order to find the duodenum and tease out that pylorus. And in those instances, I'm going to hold the probe a little bit more like a torch um, rather than a pen. Um, so um, the way that you hold the probe, it is going to change um, depending on what you're doing, depending on what structure you're looking for, um, depending on what your specific needs are at any particular time during the examination. But broadly speaking, um, you're either kind of holding it like a pen or you're holding it like a torch. The other thing to mention is how you orient the position of your probe um, with the image on the screen. And you guys may have noticed that all of our probes have little markers on one side. So this could be linear probe and has a little marker just here. The convex probe has this little dimple here. Um, the linear probe has a very similar marker and dimple onto the curvilinear probe. And then you've got this um, little uh, sort of vertical line just at one end of the hockey stick probe. And, and what these markers do is they help us orient ourselves uh, relative to the image that's displayed on the ultrasound screen. And the, the marker on the screen varies depending on 
the type of scanner that you're using. Um, in my scanner, which is a GE scanner, then we get a little helpful uh, GE trademark on one side of our sector. And, and this little GE trademark tells us which end of the probe that corresponds to. So this GE marker will always be at the end where the dimple, the line, or the little raised indentations. So this GE marker corresponds to this side, this side, this side, this side. And that way um, you know exactly what's dorsal and what's ventral and what's left and what's right, depending on how you hold the probe. So that's how you orient it. So let's go into uh, how we move the probe. Um, so the first movement um, is the slide, um, and it moves um, a little bit like this. Um, so you fix the probe um, and you slide it along the patient. Um, so uh, we're not moving the probe in any other way here, other than in this instance to move it from cranial to caudal. Um, so there's no rotation, there's no fanning, we're not changing the pressure that we're putting on the probe, we are simply sliding it from one end to the other. Um, and that's, that's our slide, um, so that's the first one of our five movements. Um, the next one is rotate. Um, so here the probe position isn't moving, um, so there's, there's no slide. All we're doing is we're using our wrist to rotate that probe 90 degrees. So the probe is in a fixed position. Um, you fixed whatever structure it is that you're interested in uh, within your sector, and you are rotating your probe usually to change the orientation of um, the view that you're interested in. So for example, to go from a long axis view, either a sagittal or a dorsal view of a kidney to a short axis view. But it's important to note that the position of the probe on the patient doesn't change. You're not moving it cranially, you're not moving it cordially, dorsally or ventrally. Probe is fixed, you're just moving your wrist and you're rotating. Okay. So that's rotate. So push on and pull back um, is pretty self-explanatory. So some structures you're going to need to really uh, lean on the patient in order to tease them out. And you know, the first structure that you guys will encounter where you really do have to apply some pressure is, is the left of your Now here um, I am holding the probe a little bit more like a pen than I am a torch and um, that's that's really for demonstrational purposes um, because it's much easier for you guys to see what's going on if the probe um, is on the top of this little foam pan than up underneath. Um, and essentially the probe isn't moving, all you're doing is you're pushing harder, you're easing off. So you're pushing on and you're pulling off. You're not rotating it, you're not sliding it, you're just increasing or decreasing the amount of pressure that you're applying to the probe. And that's going to help you examine deeper structures um, like the left adrenal, for example. Um, so push on, pull back, and then we've got the fan. So uh, this, uh, a little bit like the rotate movement, um, the probe is in a fixed position um, and um, you are fanning your probe dorsally and you're fanning it ventrally. So the probe position doesn't change. Um, you're fanning the probe dorsally and you're fanning the probe ventrally. You're trying to shine your ultrasound beam through uh, the entire organ, um, whatever organ it happens to be that you're examining at that point. The probe is in a fixed position, you're fanning dorsally, you're fanning ventrally, you're fanning dorsally, and you're fanning ventrally. Okay, so that's that's the fan. And then we've got the follow. Um, so this is, is a movement that you'll use sort of specifically when you're examining certain structures. So um, you use this movement um, a lot when you start doing uh, GI ultrasound, for example. So um, if uh, you are looking for a uh, gastrointestinal foreign body, um, then it's it's necessary for you to be able to follow the intestine, um, either ORAD or AMORAD, to try and localize the foreign body and to try and demonstrate a differential between the small intestine 
ORAD to a potential obstruction versus ABORAD to the, to the obstruction. And if a patient does have a mechanical illness, if they are obstructed, then the ORAD intestine will be larger than the ABORAD intestine. So the intestine towards the mouth relative to the front body will be really big and full of fluid and gas, and the intestine more um, towards the, um, the colon and will be empty. Uh, you can also use it when you're trying to find ovaries, for example. So um, if, you if you find the uterine horn and um, you follow that dorsally towards the ovary, um, that can be a good way of, of finding the ovary. So um, th there are a couple of occasions where we're following a structure um, is, is super useful, and, and it is exactly that. So, so here, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm following the black wiggly line that is on our foam wedge here. Um, so it's a little bit like a slide. Um, so I'm not really rotating or, or fanning. I'm not pushing on or pulling off. Um, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm following an abdominal structure and, and a linear one at that. And uh, like I say, this is super useful for GI ultrasound. Um, and um, when you're examining structures um, that are linear, um, like, like the uterus, for example. Um, so this is this is a follow. Um, it can be very tricky. Um, so uh, it, it's it's certainly not easy to uh, to fix the probe in terms of its position and pressure to um, not necessarily move your probe in any other way unless it's absolutely necessary in order for you to follow that structure and um, go right the way through the, the GI tract. It, it, it's pretty tricky. That's um, that's that's quite a hard one, and that, that comes a little bit later. All right, um, so now we know what probe we're going to use, and um, we know how to hold our probe, and we have some idea of um, what we're going to do with the probe um, once the probe is placed on the patient. Um, we can now take a closer look at our ultrasound machine. Um, this is the machine that I have at um, London Veterinary Specialists, so it's a GE Logic ER7. and. Uh, at first glance, um, it, it can seem a little bit intimidating because there are a whole bunch of buttons here um, that uh, we may or may not know how to use. And um, the reality is that there are only really a couple of buttons that you're going to use um, frequently, day to day, while you're doing your ultrasound examinations. Um, so um, we can take a look at those buttons and um, we can also uh, look in a little bit more detail at exactly what they do. And the buttons really that you guys need to uh, find on your machine and get familiar with um, would be the overall gain, um, the time gain compensation, uh, the button um, or the wheel that allows you to change the depth um, and the button or the wheel that allows you to change uh, either the number um, or the position of your focal point. So, um, this is the keyboard for the, uh, the ER7, and yeah, a closer inspection, we can see that this, this is our gain here, and this is, this is our depth, and this is our time gain compensation. Um, not that easy to see how we change the uh, focus position or the focus number, and uh, we will see that it is uh, hidden. Um, on the screen rather than on the keyboard. Um, so uh, this is uh, our gain. So let's take a little look at uh, what happens when you adjust the gain. So let's go back to my laser pointer for a second. So this, this is our gain here. This is what it looks like. And this is what happens when you change the gain. So that's turning the gain all the way up. So all, all of our sector is getting brighter and all of our sector is getting darker as we toggle our overall gain. So let's let's do that again. So this uh, is uh, our image as it starts. This is me turning the gain up. So all of our sector is getting bright, and then we're going to turn the gain down, and all of our sector is getting dark. Um, so that's what happens um, when you alter the overall gain. So all of it gets bright, all of it gets dark, um, depending on what you're trying to achieve. So our time gain compensation um, consists of all of these sliders in the top left hand corner of our keyboard. And what the time gain compensation does is it allows us to um, 
alter the gain depending on depth. So the slider at the top represents the gain in the very near field of our sector, and the slider at the bottom represents the gain in the very far field of our sector. And what we're trying to achieve um, is uh, a uniform echogenicity throughout our sector. So we don't want one part of our image being super bright and another part being super dark. Um, we, we'd like it to be balanced and even throughout. So if you're finding that you need um, a little bit more intensity in the far field of your sector, then you can toggle the time gain compensation um, of the bottom sliders. And um, equally, if, if you're finding for whatever reason that um, the in the near field, it's maybe too bright and it's too intense and there's too much gain there, then you can just slide them back. So let's see what happens when we have a little play around with the sliders of our time gain compensation. So this is me just pushing the sliders from top to bottom, um, from left to right. So increasing them all in turn from top to bottom and then decreasing them from top to bottom. And, and you can see that we don't get an overall change in the gain. We get different points at different depths getting brighter or darker depending on which slider that we're adjusting. So let's take another look at that. So that's the top sliders going from left to right. So going up right the way from the near field to the far field. And I'm doing it in the opposite direction, the opposite way. So um, right from the bottom, right to the top, going from right to left on the sliders. And um, so that's what um, your time gain compensation does. It isn't the same as overall gain. So overall gain, um, when you alter that, all of your sector is going to get brighter, all of it's going to get dark. With your time gain compensation, then you can choose the depth at which you'd like to toggle the gain. So you can make fine, finer adjustments, more specific adjustments to the overall echogenicity and balance of your sector image. So that's what the time gain compensation looks like. Um, oftentimes when you see this um, set up, you, you see these sliders set up so they're in a, in a diagonal. So you, you, you're effectively dampening the intensity of the returning echoes from the near field and um, you're enhancing the intensity of the echoes from the far field because um, these echoes returning from the far field are going to be um, more uh, attenuated essentially. So um, you're more likely to have um, very dark far field and very bright near field. So off, oftentimes you'll, you'll see them set up in a, in a diagonal, um, which is entirely real. Okay, so this is our depth. So our depth is is just here. Um, so um, I mean, our depth is is exactly that. So when um, we are looking at a very superficial structure, we need to reduce our depth. Um, and when we're looking at a very deep structure, we will need to increase our depth. Um, and that's, that's going to change the scale on the right side of our screen here. So, so here we've we've got um, three centimeters depth. And um, if we play around with it, then um, that's going to change. So let's see what happens um, when we start fiddling about with our depth. So uh, that's increasing the depth. You guys can see that um, that vessel, um, which I believe is, um, I think it's my pulsing common carotid artery, has disappeared off into the distance. And we're now, and I've got 10 centimeters, eight centimeters, six centimeters of depth right the way back down to three, and then we can um, reduce that depth still further um, and make it two centimeters. So yeah, um, what you, you don't want to be doing is you don't want to be trying to uh, examine a structure um, with uh, too much depth selected. I mean, this would be really suboptimal. So why have we got such a high depth set up on our screen? So the structure we're interested in is way off there in the distance. Um, we're going to need to change our depth so that the structure that we're interested in um, is, is more in the near field so we can see what's going on, um, so we can see it. So um, the de depth is something that you're going to fiddle about with quite often during your ultrasound exam, um, because uh, sometimes you're going to be looking at superficial structures, sometimes you're going to be looking at um, deeper structures. Um, so yeah, the depth gauge is, is one that you're going to get very familiar with. So our focus, position and our focus number, that's that's kind of hidden. So on uh, this G machine, um, if we look at the screen rather than at the keyboard, um, then uh, at this point here, just above this little wheel, it are two little tabs on our screen, one of them being focus position and the other being focus number. So this, this is our, our, our focal point here, and this is where our resolution 
is optimized. So um, our focal point needs to be at the um, depth of the structure that we're examining and that we're most interested in, because that's where our resolution is going to be optimized. So if we're looking at, at this vessel here, then our focal position is um, at a at an appropriate level. Um, you don't necessarily need to increase the number of focal points that often. Um, I think the equine guys do it quite a lot doing musculoskeletal ultrasound, but it's it's rare that I'll feel the need to have more than one um, focal point. Um, it, it's, it's often much more common to forget to adjust the position of your single focal point such that you're examining a structure without having optimized um, your resolution. So um, in order to flip between focus position and focus number, you essentially have to push this button down in the middle um, and then you use the wheel um, to change the uh, focus position or the focus number. So we can um, have a look, see what happens um, when we do that. And the thing to keep an eye on is the two little green egg timers on the right there. So that's me really changing the position um, of our focal point um, from the near field into the far field and like I say that focal point should be at the, the depth of the structure that you're most interested in. So if you're interested in a structure that is in the near field then your focus position should be in the near field. If you're interested in a structure that is in the far field then you need to change the position of that focus um, to the far field so that you're optimizing your resolution um, based on the position of the structure that you're examining. Um, so that's that's focus position and focus number um, on, on the GE logic. Um, like I say, they're, they're not the easiest things to find. Um, so they're actually um, uh, little tabs on the screen rather than on the keyboard. And, and all of these um, all of these functions um, will be in different positions and look different depending on what machine you're using. But yeah, the things to look out for, like I say, gain, depth, time gain compensation, focus number, focus position. Okay, so uh, now we know what probe we're using. Uh, we know how to move the probe and how to hold it. And we know a little bit more about how to use our machine. So uh, we know that during the exam, we're going to have to uh, toggle our gain. We're going to have to change our depth. We're going to have to alter our focus position depending on what structure we're interested in. And we might even um, need to um, change um, the uh, focal number as well, um, depending on what type of exam we're doing. Um, so now we need to think about our patients. And um, when we have a patient that needs abdominal ultrasound, um, that patient is going to need to remain still for, I would say, at least 20 to 30 minutes. So uh, abdominal ultrasounds are not uh, a, a quick procedure. Um, so um, it isn't necessarily something that you can do in, in five minutes. If, if you want to do a good complete accurate abdominal ultrasound scan. Um, even if you're a very experienced sonographer, I would say it's going to take a minimum of, of 20 minutes. And if you're inexperienced, then it's going to take longer. And most dogs and a lot of cats um, are not going to tolerate lying still for 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so you need to think about um, how you are going to get around that. Um, you're also not going to be able to do an ultrasound exam um, in a furry patient without clipping it. Um, so we can talk a little bit about the clip. Um, and you also need to get comfy. Um, so uh, if you're going to be doing the scan for at least 30 minutes, um, then you need to make sure um, that um, you are comfy, that your shoulder doesn't hurt, that your elbow doesn't hurt. Um, you need to be sitting down. Um, yeah, you, you need to, to get yourself comfy um, and comfortable in the knowledge that you're going to be there for at least the next 30 minutes. And this isn't, this isn't a quick job, this isn't something that you can um, wash out quickly uh, between um, between bridge space. You know, this is something that you need to invest some time to do it properly. So uh, the best way to effectively restrain your patients is to get yourself an exceptional anaesthetist. Um, so this is David and he is an exceptional anaesthetist and we are very lucky to have him at uh, LVS and without David um, I wouldn't be able to do my job essentially. Um, so David uh, manages and organizes all of the chemical restraint for the patients that have uh, any sort of imaging at LVS, um, so ultrasound, um, radiographs and CT. Um, so um, my advice would be uh, that 
most patients, the vast majority of patients are going to need some degree of sedation in order to do a complete, accurate, comprehensive ultrasound exam. Some patients, um, you can do it conscious, um, but the vast majority, they are going to need something just to take the edge off, just to make sure that they'll tolerate lying still for a good half an hour and um, you poking um, at their abdomen, um, getting all those injuries that you need. Um, so um, I would say uh, if you're in first opinion practice, then you are going to be way better than I am in terms of coming up with appropriate sedation protocols, because that isn't something that I've had to do for a long time. And I suppose the thing to take away is um, chemical restraint, safe, appropriate, chemical restraint um, is, is essential um, if you're looking to do um, a comprehensive, accurate abdominal ultrasound exam. And I'm very fortunate in that I have a David um, to help me do that. Uh, for the clip, um, this is an example of uh, the before and after um, of a little dash end um, that I've clipped. Um, so I tend to do pretty big clips. Um, so what I've seen a lot of people do is is to clip and, and to sort of use the caudal border of the rib as the cranial margin of the clip. Um, I, I tend to go a little bit further cranial and a little bit further dorsal than that. So um, in terms of landmarks, um, I tend to find the caudal border of the last rib and, and go at least four fingers cranial to that um, and then all the way ventral. Um, so th there are there are some structures up here in the craniodorsal part of the abdomen that you're going to need to see. So I mean, the head of the spleen is, is going to be up here somewhere. There's going to be liver here as well that it, it's worth taking a look at using an intercostal window. And if, if your clip only extends as far as the caudal border of the ribs, um, then you're going to be a little bit restricted in examining those structures. It is entirely possible to see all of those structures because you, you could pop the probe up under the ribs um, and you can fan dorsally and look at the head of the spleen and look at the liver. But I, I tend to find, um, I like to do both. So um, I tend to come up underneath the ribs and I tend to go into costal. Um, and without having a nice big clip, it's impossible to do that. And um, all of this area is going to grow back. So the reason why the patient is um, with you is because um, the patient's vet is concerned that there is something serious enough to warrant an abdominal ultrasound. At that particular moment, um, we're not um, particularly concerned about the hair coat or grooming this patient. Um, our priority is making sure that our abdominal ultrasound is the um, best, most accurate, most comprehensive scan it can possibly be. And for me, uh, that means a lot of this hair needs to go. Okay, um, so landmarks for, for me, find the corner board of the last rib, go at least four centimeters cranial um, and then come down. You, you, you should be cranial um, to the sophisticated here because that's, that, that's where your probe's going to be when you're going to be coming back the ribs. So this is me uh, recently scanning um, a cat um, and this is just really to demonstrate uh, kind of ergonomics. So um, when I was in practice, you know, I'd, I'd see people trying to do ultrasound scans kind of standing up, um, sort of bring the patient conscious and heavily heavily restrained on the x-ray table, contorting themselves into all kinds of shapes and sizes uh, while they were trying to do this abdominal ultrasound. And um, that, that really isn't to be advised. So you're going to be there for at least half an hour. You need to get comfortable. Um, you need to have the patient in an appropriate position on the table. Um, the table needs to be the correct height and um, to support your elbow and your shoulder. I, I, ideally, I would actually have um, my little uh, Velcro cuff. I shouldn't ideally have the lead around my neck here um, because that, that doesn't help with shoulder strength. Um, so everything needs to be optimized in terms of your height, the way that you sit, where your elbow is, where your hand is, to make sure that you're comfy, you're not going to hurt your back, you're not going to hurt your neck, um, you're not going to get shoulder strain, you're not going to hurt your wrist. Um, you're going to be able to do this all day, every day, all week if necessary, and uh, not come out of it with any kind of repetitive strain injury. And um, I mean, the main one really is, is the shoulder. So when you're, you're leaning on big patients um, and you're rotating your wrists simultaneously, um, that, that can really aggravate your rotator cuff. And if, if you manage to ping something in your shoulder and your shoulder becomes painful, then you're not going to be able to do any ultrasound scans. Um, so uh, prevention is, is better than cure. Um, make sure that um, you don't 
end up with neck problems, back problems, shoulder problems. Make sure that when you're doing these scans, um, because you know once you start to get into it, you're going to be doing more and more of them. Um, that you're comfy um, and you're not having to start with this. Okay. So um, once I have the patient in front of me, and this is uh, the the list of structures that um, I'm going to need to tick off. So initially, the patient is going to be in light lateral recumbency, um, and I tend to start with the left kidney and then move on to the left adrenal, um, slide cranially and find the spleen. Um, in cats, um, I'll then slide cranially and ventrally and look for the left lobe of the pancreas, which will be in between the spleen, the stomach and the colon, um, and then move on to the stomach, making sure that we examine all of the stomach, um, including the fundus, the antrum and the pylorus. Um, that then leads nicely onto the liver. And again, we need to be confident that we've examined all the different parts of the liver. So not only the hepatic parenchyma, but we've looked at the gallbladder, um, the portal vein um, and other parts of the biliary system. So um, the common bile duct, um, including the cystic duct and the duodenal papilla, if that's possible. Uh, coming back to the portal vein, um, the hepatic lymph nodes, usually sit adjacent to the portal vein. So it's a good time to take a look at those hepatic lymph nodes. If they're big, that can clue us into there being some sort of hepatic pathology. If we haven't seen anything on our initial skin through the liver and we've got big hepatic lymph nodes, then I'd suggest going back and taking another look and making sure that we haven't missed anything. From that, we're going to go to the other end of the patient. Um, so we're going to go right the way to the aortic bifurcation and we're going to uh, fan and look for the medial and internal iliac lymph nodes. From there, it's just a short slide ventrally to the urinary bladder. And when we're examining the bladder, we need to make sure that we look at the trigone and if we can see them, the urethrovesicular junctions. Um, from there, um, it's not too far to the prostate um, or the uterus and the ovaries, um, depending on if you have a male or a female patient. Um, and um, just to finish off on this side, we look at the GI, so the colon, follow the colon cranially uh, to find the ileocecocolic junction and the ileocecocolic and colonic lymph nodes, um, and then a screen through the middle of the abdomen, looking at the small intestine and the mesenteric lymph nodes. Uh, during this uh, presentation, we're just looking at urogenital, so we're just going to look at the left kidney, um, the medial iliac lymph nodes, the urinary bladder, the prostate, the uterus, and um, the ovaries on this side. And um, at that point, you're going to flip the patient over. Um, so the patient is now in left lateral recumbency. Um, the the head um, is still on the same side, so the head is is still um, adjacent to your ultrasound machine. Um, and we're going to start with the the right kidney. Um, if it's a female entire patient, the right ovary. Um, from there, not too far to the right adrenal, which should be in between the right kidney and the caudal vena cava. Take a look at the um, the right liver um, and the gallbladder. And if um, we're getting into more advanced ultrasound using an intercostal approach with the patient in left lateral recumbency, uh, it's possible to examine the caudal vena cava um, and the portal vein. So this would be the view that we'd use for looking at portal systemic shunts, um, but that comes up a bit later. Um, in cats, um, it's possible then to go from the right kidney to the duodenum and look at the duodenal papilla um, and the common bile duct. Um, you can look at the pylorus as well from here. So if you've struggled to see the pylorus with a patient in the right lateral recumbency, um, you can take another look um, from here. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit harder with them in left lateral um, because all the gas is going to go to the non-dependent part of the abdomen. So the duodenum and the pylorus and the entrum are going to be full of gas, um, but sometimes it can be easy. Uh, see the right lobe of the pancreas just next to the duodenum. Um, and then moving to the caudal part of the dog, the right medial iliac, and then another quick look at the colon, the elusic colic, and the small intestines, and all the corresponding lymph nodes. In this presentation, as I say, we just do a gentle, so we're just going to look at the right kidney um, and the right ovary with the patient in left lateral recumbency. And um, just like uh, you would evaluate a radiograph, um, you need to keep it simple and just get back to those wrenching cells. So the things that you're going to comment on are going to be the location of the organ, um, its size, its shape, its modulation, and its echogenicity. And if you're commenting on all of those different features, um, then you really can't go far wrong. So is the organ in the right place? Is it the right size? Is it the right shape? Um, do its, are its margins appropriate? So it's absolute margins. Um, and what section is it like? Um, is it too bright? Is it too dark? Um, is it very heterogeneous? 
Okay, so let's start with the left kidney. And so when um, we are starting our examination with the left kidney, and the probe starts um, just caudal to the last uh, rib, and you're very good, so because that's essentially where the kidney is. So let's just play this video and see what the left kidney looks like. So this is me just, just having placed the probe onto the patient, and we can see we've got um, a really nice um, sagittal view of this left kidney, um, and immediately um, it, it's, it's looking nice and normal. So it's, it's kidney shaped, um, it's got nice smooth margins, and it's got a bright cortex, it's got a dark medulla, it's got beautiful cortical medullary definition. Um, we can see the margins between the different renal calices, we can see the renal pelvis, and the bright fat that usually surrounds the renal pelvis, in terms of size, um, anything between about 32 and 42 millimetres in a cat in terms of renal length would be fine with a bit of leeway uh, either side. So if it's a particularly small cat, then it's OK for them to have particularly small kidneys. And if you're a particularly big cat, then it's OK to have big kidneys. Um, in dogs, it's, it's a bit more tricky to judge renal size. The, the, if we're going to try and be objective about it, we can compare the renal length to the thickness of the aorta, and it's usually 5.5 to 9.1 times um, the thickness or the width of the aorta at the level of the renal artery. Um, but this, this is a nice sagittal view of the kidney, and it looks um, absolutely normal. Um, so that's me with the probe fixed, very subtle movements, maybe a little bit of fanning, and now I'm fanning dorsally and ventrally, um, and now I've rotated my probe, so I've got a short axis view of this left kidney. Um, so. Um, rotated my probe around 90 degrees. This is now my short axis. Again, we've just got cortex, we've got medulla, nice cortical medullary definition, and we've got the renal pelvis here. This would be the view that you'd use if you were measuring the size of the renal pelvis. If you say you had a cat that you thought might have urethral obstruction, this, this renal pelvis um, is completely normal. It's very difficult to, to see any fluid in this renal pelvis, which is essentially um, how it should be. So now I'm just sliding cranially and caudally through this left kidney, having rotated it, making sure that I've shown my ultrasound beam right the way through that kidney. Um, so um, if you've got a nice either sagittal or dorsal view of the kidney, which I have, and you've fanned dorsally and ventrally through that kidney, which I have, and it looks normal, and you rotated it, and you've slid the probe cranially, and you've slid the probe Cordially, and all looks absolutely fine, then you can be pretty confident that you've done um, a very comprehensive ultrasound examination of that left kidney. Um, essentially, it's time to move on. So normally I then move on to the left adrenal, but because this is um, a urogenital presentation, we're actually going to um, go uh, to the back end of the dog to look at the medial and internal iliac influence. Now, for, for these structures, um, you're going to place your probe um, on the caudal part of the abdomen. So, um, I mean, really uh, just cranial to the pelvis. And you're going to have to um, just, just lean on the abdomen slightly. So just push on slightly um, until you can see the greater vessels. Um, so let's see uh, if we can find the medial iliac. Right. So, so here um, I've got the aorta, uh, the aortic bifurcation. We can see the um, external iliac arteries um, extending beyond the bifurcation. We're just looking for a structure just, just next to it. And, and in this dog, because they're normal, they're, they're, they're kind of hard to see. Um, but if you just look very carefully, you can see that there's a little sausage shaped structure just here that most likely represents the left medial iliac lymph node. And there's another one just adjacent to it, which is probably the internal iliac lymph node. But in terms of your movements, um, you have put the probe um, on the caudal part of the abdomen, just cranial to the pelvis, and you just pushed on slightly just to tease out um, those greater vessels. And then you're fanning dorsally and ventrally at the level of the bifurcation, and you're looking for um, sort of an, a more hyperechoic um, sausage-shaped structure, if they're normal, just adjacent to the bifurcation, so just adjacent to the external iliac arteries. And um, if you don't see anything, then it's probably this structure here in the stock. If you don't see anything, then that's absolutely fine, uh, because if they're normal, um, then you might not see them. But it's um, super important to get used to um, looking for those medial and internal iliac lymph nodes, because when 
they are abnormal, they can be uh, exceptionally abnormal. They can get very, very large indeed. And sometimes um, you'll find very large medial and internal iliac lymph nodes in patients um, where you wouldn't necessarily expect them to find them. So I've had a number of patients that have presented for other reasons, say uh, suspected gastrointestinal disease, and I found big medial and internal iliac lymph nodes. And on closer inspection, it turns out that the patient actually has a mass associated with one of their renal glands, and it turns out that they have an iliac gland up carcinoma. Um, so uh, anything sinister affecting the caudal part of the patient, um, so anal glands, um, bladder, um, so patients that have, say, transitional cell carcinomas affecting their uh, bladder, um, the urethra, or patients that have prostatic carcinomas, these lymph nodes are going to be super big. Um, so um, if you can't see them, then that's fine. Um, but get used to developing that muscle memory and looking for them. Um, because if you do find very abnormal medial and internal iliac lymph nodes, it, it can be super helpful. Um, and um, sometimes you can find things um, that, that the patient, um, the owner, that the um, primary vet wasn't even aware of, like um, anal sac carcinomas. So, those are the medial iliac lymph nodes, um, and from there, it's just a short walk to the urinary bladder. So just sliding ventrally, essentially. And um, so um, now, uh, in order to get nice images of the urinary bladder, um, you are going to have to just, just lift up the patient's hind limb. And in most of you guys that have picked up a pro, you will be pretty confident about finding urinary bladders. I'm sure that, that tons of you, even if you're just starting out, will have done cystos. So you pop the probe um, in the mid-abdomen um, caudally, so they're, they're called the mid-abdomen, um, and you're going to find the urinary bladder essentially, and, and it looks exactly as expected to look, um, like a very smoothly marginated uh, anechoic uh, balloon, um, so uh, the uh, uh, viscous filled with fluid, um, and the important thing, again, is that you do a comprehensive assessment of the urinary bladder. And so that consists of um, sliding from cranial to caudal initially, and fanning slightly as you go, um, and then rotating the probe 90 degrees so you've got a short axis view of the urinary bladder, and again, sliding cranially and sliding caudally. Now, one of the biggest um, mistakes that I think people make, um, and one of the main reasons for missing lesions in the urinary bladder um, is the probe position. So if you imagine where the urinary bladder is, it's, it's about here. And um, if you're a stone, then you're going to sit in the most dependent part of the urinary bladder lumen. So you're gonna sit right next to the table um, because that's where gravity wants you to be. And in order to see stones in the most dependent part of the abdomen, um, you need to essentially point your probe directly downwards at the table um, in order to pick them out. What, what you don't want to do is you don't want to be shining your probe just across the ventral surface of the bladder, so the non-dependent aspect of the urinary bladder lumen, and miss the stones. You need to have the probe pointing directly downwards so you can examine the dependent part of that bladder. If you don't do that, then it's very easy um, to miss some systems that might be um, hiding in that region. So let's take another look at this video. So that's me having popped the probe on the urinary bladder and the mid part of the caudal abdomen. I'm doing a little bit of fanning dorsally and ventrally and sliding cranially um, beyond the apex um, of the urinary bladder there. And I'm sliding caudally and I've teased out the trigone, which we can see just here, and then part of the uh, urethra. Um, so that's a predilection site for things like um, transitional cell carcinomas in the dog, and not so much in the cat, but um, worth, um, again, developing that muscle memory, teasing out that trigone, looking at that urethra, um, that's nice and normal. So it's again sliding cranially back to the mid body of the bladder, um, and then I'm gonna rotate my probe. Um, so I've got the bladder in short axis now, um, and then I'm sliding cranially um, beyond the apex, and slide cordially again. Um, back um, to the level of the trigone and the UVJs. So you, you can't always see them, um, so I'm not convinced that we can see them here, um, not, not very easily anyway. Um, but uh, again, very used to, very useful um, to try and pick out those UVJs because particularly in cats, sometimes um, you can see a little urethralith just lodged at the level of the UVJ um, and it can be quite tricky to see. So they're probably just there, those the, the UVJs. They just look like little bumps, essentially. That's, that's probably 
you reach a reticular junction and there's one there as well. Um, so as, as after you've rotated the probe and you're getting a short axis view of the bladder and you're sliding cordially towards the trigone, you're just looking for, for two little tiny bumps um, in the mucosa, um, and those are the UVJs. Again, if you don't see them, then don't worry, they're probably normal. Um, and occasionally, like I say, in cats that have uh, obstructed ureters, that have ureteral lifts, um, you, you do that exact movement. So you rotate the probe, so lattice and short axis, and slide the probe cordially, um, and then you'll see a little hyperechoic shadowing structure just at the level of the UVJ, and that'll be the reason why the cat's obstructed. That'll be the point at which it's obstructed, and that's super useful information to give um, to the vet and potentially um, the surgeon who might um, be having to sort that patient out further. So there we go. That is your interview by that. That moves us on to prostate. So um, prostate, uh, very similar sorts of movements to the urinary bladder. So the same movements that you're using to examine the trigone, um, you're using those movements to examine the prostate. And so once the, you place the probe on the caudal abdomen, caudal mid abdomen, um, you can slide the probe caudally, um, just looking for the trigone. Um, and then if you slide it even further cordially, hopefully the prostate should pop up. And that's, that is our prostate just here. So this, is, this is our prostate. That's, that's one of the prostatic lobes here. That's the other prostatic lobe here. And this is the urethra going right the way through the middle of um, that prostate. Um, so uh, that's a nice and normal prostate. Um, so it's, it's symmetrical. It's got um, a uniform echogenicity. Um, and we can see both of the lobes are exactly the same size. And the prostatic uh, urethra looks absolutely normal. Um, it's, a, it's a very happy looking prostate. So uh, we're not going to talk too much about pathology today because this is more about technique. Um, but when you're looking at prostates, looking at size, um, is it appropriate given the patient? So um, is it a male entire dog? Is it a male neutered dog? Um, is, is the shape normal? So I'd expect the prostate to be symmetrical. Um, here it is, this is a short axis view. We've got one lobe there, we've got another lobe there, it's nice and symmetrical. Is the echogenicity normal? Um, yep, it's it's uniform, um, it's, it's coarse, which is what I'd expect it to be for a prostate. Um, we're not seeing um, any uh, abnormal discrete structures within that prostatic parenchyma. We're not seeing any mineralization within that prostatic parenchyma. It's super significant um, in terms of diagnosing prostatic carcinoma. So there are no discrete focal hyperechoic shadowing areas within this prostatic parenchyma that might convince us that this prostate is mineralized because if you start seeing min a mineralized prostate particularly in a male neutered patient then you are starting to get very concerned that it could be some sinister like um, a prostatic carcinoma and for a prostate is the fat around it normal because um, if there is a prostatitis um, for whatever reason then the periprostatic fat is going to get um, very angry and that fat is going to get thick and hyperechoic. Um, and this prostate is, is absolutely normal, um, which uh, is great. So that's a nice normal prostate. So again, probe, caudal part, the abdomen, midline, uh, sliding caudally. And we're trying to tease out the trigone and the urethra. So very subtle fanning movements um, to try and tease out that trigone and urethra, sliding a bit further cordially as far as you can go um, to try and fix um, that prostate. And then once you've got it in long axis, I've just rotated my probe there to get into short axis. And then you can slide cranially, slide cordially again in short axis, making sure that you've shone that ultrasound beam right the way through all of that prostatic parenchyma. You can be confident that you've done a comprehensive ultrasound examination of that prostate. Testicles are uh, super easy, um, exactly where to find them. Um, now, uh, I mean, here you literally are just popping the probe um, onto the uh, testicle um, in order to examine it. Um, I'd, I'd actually usually use a linear probe rather than the microconvex probe um, to look at um, the testicle. And here, just for the purposes of demonstration, I'm using um, the microconvex probe. Um, so, uh, I mean, the main thing about testicles is <coughs> don't don't forget to examine them. So, if if you have a male entire dog, um, it can be really easy um, to do a beautiful, comprehensive abdominal ultrasound, and then forget to look at the testicles. And um, if that patient comes back um, a couple of months later and 
it's got a big testicular tumor. Um, you missed it because, well, not because you weren't capable of picking out a testicular nodule or a tumor or ultrasound, it's just you forgot to look because the vast majority of our patients are muted rather than tired. So um, the thing for me to take away from this is, is don't forget to look at the testicles in the entire dogs. So you pop the probe on uh, your patient and, and here uh, we can see that um, I'm going to need to change the position of my focal point. So um, I've gone from examining um, a deeper structure, probably the prostate, to examining a much more superficial structure. So my, my focal point way down here, it kind of should be up here because this, this is where the structure that I'm interested in is. Um, so this is this is our testicle. Um, it's nice and normal. The, the, the the, the structure, the testicular structure you guys need to pay most attention to is this linear hyperechoic area that runs right through the middle of the testicle, which is the mediastinum testis. Now, the reason that's significant is that um, you will probably be called upon at some stage to look for an intra-abdominal testicle in a cryptorchid patient. And it can be very difficult to tell the difference between um, uh, an abdominal lymph node and an intra-abdominal testicle. And the way you can tell the difference is that a lymph node doesn't have a mediastinum testis. So a lymph node will not have um, a linear hyper echoic structure running right through the middle of it. So the mediastinum testis is pretty exclusive to the testicle and it's something that allows us to differentiate testicular tissue from other tissue um, like lymph nodes when we're doing abdominal ultrasound examination. Now there's, there's no chance of us um, confusing this as being anything other than the testicle in this dog because the testicles are in a normal location um, and just the same as for any other structure um, you fix the probe and you fix your structure in the center optimize your image depth focal point time gain gain etc and then you just fan your probe um, right the way through the middle of this structure making sure that you've looked at every part of the testicle um, the testicular body um, epididymis etc um, this is this is a pretty normal looking testicle so those are the testicles. Um, in terms of the uterus, um, unfortunately, I don't have um, a video to show you of the uterus because we really don't see that many female entire dogs at LVS. Now, um, the landmarks for finding the uterus um, are the colon and the urinary bladder. So um, you pop the probe onto the uh, caudal abdomen, um, start um, at the mid abdomen, and you slide cordially um, to find the urinary bladder. Once you found the main body of the urinary bladder, you rotate your probe 90 degrees, so you've got your bladder in short axis, and you slide your probe cranially. And what you're looking for is you're looking for a structure between the colon and the urinary bladder. Um, and that's going to be the uterine body. So this is your colon, this is your urinary bladder, and you've got a little structure that quite helpfully here has a bunch of arrows um, helping us see it, um, which is the uterine body. Now this is just going to be super useful when you guys are diagnosing pyometras. Um, so uh, we don't really see many pyos at all at LVS, but when I was in first opinion, uh, particularly in charity practice, you know, we'd see one pyo a week. Um, and they're often pretty straightforward to diagnose, put the probe on the caudal abdomen, and there's a big fluid-filled structure that shouldn't be there staring at you in the face. Um, now, that's fine if it's a really obvious giant fluid-filled pyo, but if you're looking for um, smaller pyos and more subtle changes to the uterine body, then you need to develop a technique to reliably find the uterus um, on every occasion in every patient. And that's the way to do it. So you need to remember what your landmarks are. Your landmarks are colon and urinary bladder, and the uterine bodies between the colon and urinary bladder. Find the bladder, rotate the probe, so you've got the urinary bladder in short axis. Slide cranially um, until um, you get to a point where hopefully you're between the colon and the urinary bladder, and usually you're going to have to um, just angle your probe dorsally slightly in order to achieve that. And the structure that's between the colon and the urinary bladder is the uterine body. So that's how you find it. So there's sort of two ways of, of finding the left ovary. Um, either um, you can start um, at the level of the left kidney um, and slide caudally, and hopefully the left kidney should be, the left ovary should be just caudal to the left kidney. So use the technique that we talked about um, for examining the left kidney. So uh, pop the probe just caudal to the uh, last room with the patient in right lateral recumbency and um, rotate the probe 90 degrees, um, so you've got the kidney in uh, short axis, and then slide cordially, and you're looking for a little blobby structure that is going to be just caudal to that 
your left kidney. Now, the appearance of the ovary is going to change depending on what stage of the uterus cycle the patient is in. Um, in this patient, we've got this uh, hypoechoic uh, structure within the body of the ovary. It's difficult to know whether that's a cyst or whether it's a tumor follicle, um, but uh, there's no mistaking uh, this structure as the left ovary because, again, I apologize, I can't show you this using the video, um, this structure is also attached to the um, left uterine horn. So if there is any doubt as to whether or not um, a structure that you've picked up just caudal to the left kidney is an ovary, um, then you can come at it from the opposite direction. So find the uterine body um, using the technique that we've talked about. So um, find the urinary bladder, rotate your probes, go in short axis, slide cordially, angle slightly dorsally, um, look for the uterine body in between the colon and the urinary bladder, bladder and then follow um, that uterine body to its bifurcation, find the, find the left uterine horn, follow it, and then you should get to whatever structure that you feel is the left one. So either you can come at the ovaries from, well, from cranial starting point or a caudal starting point. So cranially, your landmark is going to be left kidney and the left ovary should be caudal to it. And caudally, your landmark is going to be uterine body, left horn, follow, find the left ovary. Um, it, they, they can be tricky to see um, sometimes ovaries, particularly if they're really small. Um, so don't be disheartened if, if you're just starting out and you, you have a female type dog and you're struggling to find the ovaries. And they, they, they can be tricky to, to tease out sometimes. So at this point in the exam, um, you're going to flip the door over. Um, so it's going to go from uh, right lateral to left lateral. And, and that's going to make it uh, easier for us to examine the structures on the right side of the patient. Um, and, uh, that starts with the right kidney. Um, so we flip this little doggy over now. Um, so legs are away from me as the sonographer. Head is in the same location. And the technique for looking at the right kidney, um, very similar to the left kidney. Um, so start just caudal uh, to the last rib. Um, for, the left for the right kidney, um, you'll often have to go uh, intercostal. And um, they're often more dorsal than you expect them to be either. So um, don't skimp on the clip. Um, technique for the clip is the same on this side. So for the caudal to the last rib, go at least um, four fingers cranial um, and go all the way down ventrally and right across dorsally. Um, the right kidney is going to be pretty dorsal. Sometimes you're going to have to go into costal, um, so don't be afraid to take that hair coat off. So let's take a look at the right kidney in this patient. Um, so this is this is what it looks like. Um, again, we've got a beautiful sagittal view of that right kidney. Um, again, we're looking at all the features that we should be looking at um, when examining the kidney. So uh, it's kidney shaped. It's got beautiful smooth margins. Um, it looks like it's a normal size. It's got a bright cortex. It's got a dark medulla, um, nice bright renal pelvis and renal pelvic fat, um, nice cortical medullary definition. So looks absolutely fine. And once we're happy that we've found through our sagittal view, we're going to rotate the probe. Again, we've got a short axis view of this right kidney. Uh, and again, this is our kidney here. This is our nice bright cortex, nice dark medulla, beautiful cortical medullary definition. You can see the margins between the different renal calices. Uh, bright renal pelvic fat, renal pelvis is probably about here. Looks, looks absolutely fine. Um, so that's that's a nice normal bright kidney. And then once we've got it in short axis, we're sliding cranially, sliding cordially, making sure that we've examined all of um, this right kidney. Again, this is the renal pelvis here. Sometimes it can be tricky to, to see it. That's, that's renal pelvis in short axis. And that looks absolutely fine. That's a nice, normal right kidney. So technique, very similar um, to the um, left kidney. Um, if I think back to when I was learning how to do abdominal exercises, I, I think uh, I, I used to find the right kidney kind of harder than, than the left kidney, mostly because it was always kind of dorsal and, and, and oftentimes you do have to go into costal. So, so here, in order to get these views, I have had to go into costal because this is, this is a rib shadow here. Um, so uh, immediately you happen to go into costal, you, you're restricted slightly because you can only put the probe in between the ribs and um, you can't see between them. And it's, it's much more likely that you're going to have to take an intercostal approach when you're examining the right kidney um, rather than the left kidney. And for that reason, um, I think it can be um, a lot more challenging. Um, but that's, that's how it should look. Um, so uh, kidney shaped, smooth margins, nice bright cortex, nice dark medulla, beautiful cortical medulla demarcation. Slightly brighter fat around the renal pelvis, normal renal pelvic size. And 
Um, I don't necessarily want you guys to get hung up on measurements. Um, if, if the renal pelvis is enlarged, um, then if, if it's up to about three or four millimeters, whether it be a dog or a cat, um, then I wouldn't get too concerned about that. So quite often patients that have been on intravenous fluids, um, their renal pelvises will be slightly enlarged. And, and I'd include anything up to about three or four millimeters thick as um, a slightly enlarged renal pelvis. If you're starting to get beyond that, so if you're seeing a renal pelvis that is six, seven, eight, ten millimeters thick, then that is that is a worry. Um, it's, it's, it's likely that there is something significant and pathological going on. And if you're a cat and your renal pelvis is more than 14 millimeters thick, then chances are you're definitely obstructed. And the, the, the rule really with cats is that the bigger the renal pelvis, the more likely they are to be obstructed. If, if they get super big and they're around 14 millimeters thick, then they're, they're definitely obstructed. Um, and anything up to that, the bigger they are, the more likely they are to be obstructed. Hopefully, once you get a bit more confident, you see a big renal pelvis in a cat, you'll be able to follow the enlarged ureters and find the ureter with it. Um, but at this stage, when you're just learning how to find kidneys, um, what you should pay most attention to is getting a good short axis view of the kidneys, um, being able to confidently recognize um, the renal pelvis. Um, and then once you can do that, um, then you can start measuring um, the renal pelvis um, and get a little bit more confident about your measurements. Um, and then you'll um, start to be more confident at making significant judgment calls um, about um, how those measurements might significantly influence the ongoing um, treatment um, and prognosis for that patient. Um, but at this stage, um, just get used to uh, getting a nice short axis view of the kidney and recognizing the renal pelvis. Okay, don't get, don't get too hung up on measurements. Okay, right ovary, very similar to uh, left ovary. Um, so you can either take the cranial or the caudal approach. Um, cranial approach, uh, find the uh, right kidney, um, rotate 90 degrees so that you've got the kidney in a short axis view and then slide caudally um, until you can see a blobby structure that looks like an ovary. Um, if you're questioning whether or not that is an ovary, um, then you come at it caudally. So find the uterine body, so um, mid-abdomen, uh, find the urinary bladder, rotate the probe, so you've got the bladder in short axis, uh, it's, it's fan slightly dorsally so you can see the colon, look for a structure between the colon and the urinary bladder, that's the uterine body, follow the uterine body cranially until you find the bifurcation, isolate the right uterine horn, follow that right uterine horn all the way to the structure that you thought was the right ovary. If the two seem to join up, then it's definitely the right ovary because you wouldn't expect to find any other structure on the end of the uterine horn other than the ovary. Um, so very similar technique to um, finding the left ovary. Like I say, they, they, they can be tricky to find sometimes, and particularly when you're just starting out. Um, don't be disillusioned if, if you struggle to find ovaries at this stage, if, if you're only just starting on your journey with abdominal ultrasound. This, this right ovary um, isn't entirely normal, so it's got this, this big um, anechoic structure in the middle of it, which, which probably represents the cyst. Um, these images were taken from um, quite an elderly female, entire dog. Um, and again, the appearance of the ovaries is going to change depending on what stage of the Easter cycle um, that the patient is in. So that's right ovary. Um, and then we've got the right medial iliac lymph nodes. Um, so uh, for this, uh, we are finding the uh, aorta again, finding the aortic bifurcation, um, but on the other side this time. Um, so you're going to have to slide your probe cordially so that it's just cranial to the pelvic inlet. You're going to have to push on slightly um, just to find those greater vessels and tease them out. And then you're going to fan dorsally and ventrally again, looking for kind of a sausage shaped structure that is just adjacent to the aortic bifurcation, um, which in this dog is the structure here. Um, again, don't be disappointed if you struggle to find these lymph nodes initially. Um, just get used to um, developing that muscle memory, um, finding the aorta, finding the bifurcation, and fanning dorsally and ventrally around the bifurcation, um, looking for those lymph nodes. The more you do it, the more you will see them, the more likely it will be that you will see abnormal lymph nodes as and when they occur. That's what they look like. So they look kind of sausage shaped. And yeah, like I say, big uh, medial and internal iliac lymph nodes can clue you into um, very significant pathologies um, affecting uh, the caudal part of the patient. Um, so bladders, prostates, anal glands. All right, um, so that covers um, all of the urogenital organs. Um, hopefully you guys are a bit more clued up now about which probe you're gonna use. 
how to optimize your image quality using your uh, machine settings and feel reasonably confident that you could um, have a crack at finding uh, the kidneys, um, the uh, medial iliac lymph nodes, um, the urinary bladder, uh, the prostate, and the uterus and the ovaries. Um, if you do have any questions, um, then by all means drop me a line via um, the email that was at the start of this presentation. And uh, yeah, very, very best of luck with your adventures in ultrasound. Um, hopefully um, I will see you again to go through um, some of the um, common pathologies that we see affecting these urogenital organs. Um, and hopefully we'll get a chance to look at some other abdominal organs as well. Um, so very, very best of luck with your ultrasound. Um, keep at it. It's, it's a practical skill. Um, you uh, are not going to be able to learn how to do ultrasound by listening to me talk about it. You're going to have to start putting the probe on those patients um, and developing that muscle memory. Um, so best of luck with that. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. And um, thanks for joining me. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Bye.